Good morning. Good to see you guys again. And we're excited for the gospel meeting. I hope everybody can come back and invite friends and neighbors. And we'll try to pack this place both Sunday morning for the class and for the worship. See if you can be here for both those hours, and then we'll see how the rest of the week goes. Um, the title of our lesson this morning is An Urgency to Grow. Um, in this lesson, I wanted to uh, remind each of us that God has commanded not that we simply exist as Christians, but that we strive to grow as Christians. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter says, As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So the Bible teaches that God wants us to continually get stronger. It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been in the faith, get stronger each day. We must strive to become more spiritually mature, and discipline in the faith, uh, wiser in our knowledge of his word and how we apply it, and we need to become more productive in our service for him as the years go on. So for an individual to grow spiritually or in a spiritual sense, uh, that means you're always seeking to get better than you were uh, the day before. It's the concept of improvement. And it's certainly a lifelong call, isn't it, to grow? Uh, that from the moment you come up out of the waters of baptism, washed from your sins, having obeyed the gospel of Christ, your call is to grow, and our call is to grow as Christians, and grow every day. In scripture, uh, God compares uh, the life of a new Christian to the birth of a little baby. We see that a lot. Uh, in John chapter 3, Jesus talks about, uh, we, we must be born again, right? start afresh, start with new, in order to see the kingdom of God. Uh, we must submit to the rebirth. So, put the old man to death, become well, what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 calls us new creatures. We are old things are passed, passed away, all things have become new. And when one is born again, as the Bible talks about, many places in Scripture refers to those individuals who have just submitted to the gospel and started their walk with Christ as babes in Christ or infants in the faith. So we understand that language that when you first start out, you're a babe, a babe in Christ. As the years go by, it is the Christian's aim to work hard toward maturity in the faith so that they will not remain at the same spiritual level of a babe in Christ throughout the duration of their spiritual walk. Our call is to grow. And we cannot remain at the same spiritual level year in and year out and expect to be pleasing to our Lord because our call is to grow. That's the command that we've been given. So in this lesson, I want us to examine how we're growing. Uh, individually. So everybody look at your own self. Try not to look at the person next to you. How, are, how, how am I growing? The Bible very plainly teaches that the source of our growth, or the means by which it is possible for us to grow, is the Word of God. Uh, through study and meditation in it, if you consider 1 Peter 2.2 2 again, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. Without the Word, Spiritual growth is impossible for the Christian. It won't happen. Like milk that is fed to a newborn baby, the Bible says that in the same way, the Word of God is the source which must be taken in continually uh, so that it can help us grow. It is spiritual food and drink, nourishment for our souls, which will lead to life. What did Jesus say in Matthew 4, in verse 4? Man shall not live by bread alone, right? not just the physical food, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So uh, it's how we stay alive. It is spiritual food. We need the words of God for spiritual life. And that's not just a one-time thing. It's not just when you become a Christian that you need that word. You need it continually. Can, do you only eat once a year? Do you only eat when you're a baby? Or do you continue to eat as you grow, as you mature? Uh, John chapter 6, in verse 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So note here that the words that Jesus was speaking from heaven are the source of life. He said these words are life. So because they're given from God. So God's word teaches, it instructs, uh, it shows us the way we ought to go, how we should live our life. It produces life, it produces growth, just like food does to our physical body. And you know, Interestingly enough, Scripture teaches that spiritual life, and I think it's interesting the way God works in his infinite wisdom, 
spiritual life is both produced by the word, but then it is also sustained by the word. And I want you to think about that. It is both produced by the word, spiritual life, and it is then sustained. It is perpetuated by the word. You know, when you were an alien sinner, you know, separated from the goodness of God because of your sin, how did God bring forth spiritual life in you? How did he do it? You know, how did he go about saving your soul if you are currently a Christian? Well, I'll give you a hint. It was not some magical sprinkling of divine intervention like fairy dust, as some people seem to teach in, in the religious world. But in James chapter 1, verse 18, James gives us some insight on how God did it. He tells, uh, James tells Christians the means by which God produces spiritual life to create a new child of him. The verse says this about God. It says, of his own will, right, of his own choosing, this is how he did it. Of his own will, he brought us forth, how? By the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In the King James Version, this phrase here, uh, to bring forth, means get the word. It means that he begat us by the word of truth. Now, what does that mean, Travis? Well, that phrase you see a bunch of times in the Old Testament, uh, in the genealogies of Scripture, you see phrases like, and Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, and so on. So the concept that we see with this language is that when a father begets a son, or brings forth a son, it is done how? Through the father's seed, okay? And we understand how that works. The father's seed produces life inside the mother to create a new life, a new little baby. But did you realize that according to this passage, this is the same type of method, process of a seed, by which God produces spiritual life in us, and in sinners. It is through the implanting of his seed through which he begets a new child of him. The seed produces life. It creates a new babe in Christ. James chapter 1, verse 21 says, Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Notice the implanting in somebody's heart. That's how, and it, what is it able to do? To save your soul. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 23 talks about Christians having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. <laughs> Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So what is the seed according to this? It is the word of God that is planted in the heart of the sinner, and it gives birth. So the word of God, living and powerful, is the Father's seed by which he creates new life. And it penetrates deep into the heart of a sinner, and it convicts the heart of its need to turn back to God. It is a convincing, a persuasion. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 shows us the result of God's word hitting the hearts on the day of Pentecost. We remember when Peter spoke those words. Now, when he said this, they were cut to the heart. And the King David Version says pricked. They were pricked in their hearts. So the word of God, we know, cuts deep and it hurts and it produces conviction. So those words make you realize your sin and produce guilt. That's, that's kind of the pricking aspect of it, that you were cut. And those words, they convince you of your lost condition and, and how you are in God's sight. And then those, words, those same words persuade you that you need to turn back to God. So it's not some funny feeling that comes upon you, as some people are waiting for, but rather it's a realization or a learned process where you understand what God would have you to do to be saved. It's through knowledge. It's through learning. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4 says this about the written word. It says, by which when you read, you may understand. A lot of people in the religious world who believe you can't understand the word of God, that someone's got to explain it for you. you, can, you know, but Paul says, by which when you read, you may understand. So it's the message. The message is the power of God to draw men to himself. It's the persuasion. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the power is in the message, the gospel. It's the words. Uh, it is what God has chosen to produce spiritual life in the sinners of this world. So it, it involves convincing of a person's mind, a persuasion. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says, It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. How did he do it? Through the message. He convinced them. He showed them the way. So it, you know, it is very interesting that spiritual life is both produced by the word and then, as we're going to talk about in this lesson, it is sustained by the word. So those same words of life which lead a sinner to repent in the first place 
are the same words which lead a Christian to grow for the rest of their life. That's our theme in this lesson. Uh, those same words which God used to draw you in and convict you are the same words that God uses to keep you until the last day. And so we can't neglect the words of life. Well, they were important when we first became Christians, but they're just as important after you become a Christian as you continue on. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of mouth. You have to keep eating. You have to keep eating and feeding on the spiritual food or you will die spiritually. So it's a means to produce life and then sustain it. So point number one of the whole lesson, I wanted to make this truth very clear. Number one, the word of God is how we grow as Christians. If we're going to start talking about how can we grow, how do we look at growth, we have to understand where it comes from. So do not try to set aside the word of God and expect to grow because it's not going to happen. It does not happen because it is the spiritual life source. Sometimes Christians you know, throw up their hands and say, why am I not growing spiritually? I don't seem to be getting, getting any stronger in that sense. I, I've attended services for years. I've, I've been around Christians, godly people. Why does my growth seem to just stay the same? It's stationary. Well, based on the truths that we've discussed, the source of a growth problem is pretty simple. You know, if a Christian is lacking growth in their spiritual life, it has something to do with this. There's a great certainty that they're not doing enough of this and this, and this, and this, and this, right? It is a learning process. It is about learning the mind of God and then applying it to your life. You cannot change if you're not changing your mind first. That's all about repentance, turning your mind. So that's how growth occurs, and then it sprouts out from there. You have to put God's word in your mind. So point number two, uh, I want to piggyback off of that for the rest of the lesson. Fo let's focus primarily on this question. Because of the word, in what areas do I need to grow? That's a good question. I want to give you six areas uh, for this section in which we are commanded to grow continually, day in and day out, which are all, by the way, produced by the word. So number one, Christians must grow in faith. Certainly we know that the Bible teaches that. So when we talk about growing in faith, we're talking about growing in confidence, talked about that in our class um, this morning. Growing in confidence that these words given to us by God are true. Now, are these words really from the God of heaven? Uh, does he really exist? That's part of faith. Are, are these promises written in this book actually true? Are these teachings true? Are these teachings right? Or should I actually go out and follow this book in my daily life? You know, as you grow in faith, that means you will grow in confidence in all of these questions, that the answers are 100% absolutely yes. And you will become more certain than you were yesterday on a continual basis. You'll grow in that confidence. And you'll know these are the words of God. I know. I'm convinced of it. And as you read your Bible, you'll be convinced of that more and more every day. It convinces you. There is a God in heaven. My right? faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I know these things. Uh, his promises are true. I see these promises written in scripture and he always fulfills his promises. His teachings are true. His teachings are right. Whenever I try to go put them in my life, they always work. They always work better than I even expected and it proves itself. And yes, I should follow these words. But you know, don't be discouraged if your confidence gets weak sometimes or perhaps at the very start you have a, a weaker confidence. You know, God wants you to learn his answers and be fully convinced and he wants you to grow. So that confidence, though smaller at first, is meant to get stronger, meant to be firmer the more you learn, the more you age as a Christian. You know, think about this concept. In Luke 17, and verse 5, the apostles, even, even those who walked with Christ, made this statement to Jesus because they wanted to be even more fully convinced. What did they say? Lord, increase our faith. You know, increase it. We want more faith. What were they asking? Well, we know they are saying, Lord, speak more concerning these things so that we can be convinced even further. We want to know more. You know, give, give us more of the words from heaven that we might be further persuaded. Talk to us. Reason with us. Explain these things that we might understand and continue to give us more faith produced by the word of God. And that's certainly what Jesus uh, did throughout his earthly ministry. He spoke the words of God and reasoned with God's words 
uh, to convince people and persuade them of heaven's truth. You know, in John 7, in John 7, verse 46, even those who were enemies of Jesus had to admit, no man ever spoke like this man. You know, many of them, they saw even the signs from heaven when he would do these miraculous feats in, in front of their eyes, and some of them rejected those truths, and, and, and they wouldn't follow him, but they had to admit, I've never seen somebody speak like this, with, the, with these type of words. Jesus reasoned with the Father's reason. That's what made him so special. It was the words of God. He persuaded with divine persuasion. And nobody could stomp our Lord, right? And he convinced people using the word of God. So that's how powerful it is. And so that's what's happening when we read the words of God and when we open up the written word of God that he's given us in our book, the Bible. So they persuade us. Hebrews chapter 12 or 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, you know, it's God's tool to convict you. And it's not just at your conversion, but it is continually, when you read the God as a Christian after 10 years, when you read the Word of God after 20 years, it still pricks you and pierces your heart just as it did when you first became a Christian. Romans 10, 17, as we quoted, that so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So when you take the time to sit down with the word of God, you let God's mind reason with your mind. You think about his thoughts and his persuasion. And you read heaven's arguments. The Bible says that produces confidence. So it will convince you of heaven's truth if you will continue to let it. But if you let it just sit on the table, and you don't pick it up, and you don't read it, it's not going to do its job just sitting there. We have to pick it up. We've got to read it. And it's such a sad thing when people of this world want to throw up their hands and say, you know, that book is just a bunch of garbage. You know, it's not true. God's not real. I, I don't have to listen to that. Those words are not from God. And yet they've never tried to open it up and look at the evidence for themselves. Mm. And that's, that's really unjust to make a statement like that without looking at the evidence. Really, that's like a judge in a courtroom making a verdict before seeing the evidence. Right? I don't want to see the evidence because it might convict me. It might, it might prove me wrong. Right? So we have to examine the evidence thoroughly with an open mind and based off of the evidence, make, give a judgment. Right? So as Christians, we are told to examine this evidence continually, all the time, day in and day out. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, we read about the noble Bereans who received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Why did they search the scriptures according to that verse? Why did they study them? Well, they wanted to determine whether or not what they were hearing was true. Right? Some people act like, you know, we shouldn't ask any questions. We shouldn't have any doubts and go seek our answers. Well, that, that, it's not a blind type of faith. Okay? Never in scripture do you see the attitude where God says, just accept it. Don't ask questions. Just, you know, you know the God of heaven wants you to have questions. He wants you to think about these things. He wants you to go and search out his answers. It's not a blind type of deal. Biblical faith is, is not uh, something that one has for the lack of evidence. It's confidence that we have because of the evidence God has provided us with. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, Paul writes this. He says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every, uh, every one of you all abounds toward each other. Verse 4 says, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith, and in all, persecu in, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So Paul was able to boast of their faith uh, that had grown exceedingly. He said, you know, These Christians were being fully convinced of heaven's truth and acting accordingly. Paul said, I'm impressed by that. You guys have grown in your confidence in God's word a lot, and you're suffering through these persecutions. You couldn't have done that when your faith was weaker, and now you're producing fruit and all these things. Now remember the Bible's admonition in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without that confidence, you can't please God, that these words are true. It says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, or you have to believe he's real and he's speaking the truth, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Have to have faith and confidence in that. So, in order to be pleasing to God, 
you must be convinced of him and believe his promises. So grow in faith. Grow in faith as the years go by. The second area uh, in which Christians are to grow uh, is that we must grow in knowledge of the word. Now that's a pretty self-explanatory self -explanatory progression. Uh, if we are constantly taking in the words of God like we're supposed to, naturally, uh, we're going to start remembering things more as we study God's word and understanding things more, grasping things the way we should, if we continue to put the words in our mind. Second Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible says we're to grow in knowledge. Second uh, Peter 1.5 But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, add knowledge. That's something we need to continue. Get, get no more of this every day. Colossians 1.10 that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, uh, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, I always think of um, Perry Topham, who was an old-time preacher, and he was very old in the pulpit. He died, I think, near, near 100, maybe over 100. But I remember he used to tell the story that he would learn something new every day from the Word of God. That's how complex the Word of God is. He continues to learn something new every time. No matter if you're 90 or 100, you're going to learn something new and gain in knowledge every time you sit down. With it. So I'll say it, I'll, I'll say it again. I'll continue to say it from this pulpit. The message from heaven is a religion that is understood <coughs> not merely felt. Okay, so many people in this world act like it's all about a funny feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach. Uh, and that's what should keep you going. But that's really completely opposite of the picture you see in the Bible. Right? The understanding must come first. Then if you feel something in your heart afterwards, great. You know, It's not wrong to feel emotionally attached to this message. We ought to. Right? Our emotions must be involved. But many people try to put their feelings and their emotions into the driving seat of their religion. And they put knowledge in the back seat. So you know, we must put the knowledge of God's word in control and then uh, direct our thoughts and our feelings according to that. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul uh, writes to Timothy and he says that from childhood, Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So you know, according to this passage, what was it? that was able to guide Timothy to salvation? Was it his own thoughts and feelings? Was it his emotions that led him? Or was it some outside mystical force, right? a, a, a sprinkling of some, site, of some type? No, not at all. It was the Holy Scriptures which were able to make him wise unto salvation. So it's an understanding. It's a, it's a learned process. So the continual growth in knowledge is going to lead to life. So, you know, when you grow in knowledge of God's Word, think of some of the benefits of when we grow in our knowledge. Um, let me give you a few of these. You will be able to clearly identify sin in your life uh, so that you don't wander away from God and His Word. You're going to understand that God doesn't want me to do this, or God does want me to do that. When you study more and you understand what God wants of you, you can do better. So you can clearly identify sin. You will be able to identify false teaching uh, so that it won't lead you away from God. John 8, 32, Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, when you know the truth, you see a counterfeit when you when you, you understand when something's not the truth. Amen. It's plain as day. You know, thirdly, uh, you will know exactly what is expected of you, how to be pleasing to God. 2 Peter 1, 3 uh, tells us that uh, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given you every piece of information you need to know to be pleasing to him. And when you read those words, you can know that you're being pleasing to God because he's revealed them. 2 Timothy 2.5, that's why he tells us, study to present yourself approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's what happens when you're gaining knowledge. And I love this one. You will be able to give an answer for the truth mm. uh, to those who ask. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says that you must always be ready to give an answer. To everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The more you study, the more you learn, the better you can give an answer to those who ask. 
and maybe maybe lead to their salvation. Uh, the fifth one, uh, we will be able to handle the meat of the word as opposed to only the milk of the word. <coughs> Some of those difficult truths that were so hard for you to grasp when you first became a Christian, one day if we continue growing the way we're supposed to, we'll be able to understand these difficult concepts. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 talks about uh, Christians who had not progressed in their knowledge of God's word the way that they should have. And he says, he says, he's pretty much scolding them at this point. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, that's the point where you need to be at, you need someone again to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. You know, by now you ought to be to the point, Christians, he's scolding these individuals, where you are teaching others. That's, you've been in the faith long enough. But instead, you need these simple truths to be explained to you once again. You know, you're not, you've not been growing, is what Paul's saying in the Word. And what does that tell us about how we need to be reaching out to the lost? The Bible says we need to get to a point in our knowledge that we ought to be teaching others. James chapter 1, verse 5. Another good one says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Like God wants you to know these answers. God wants you to grow in wisdom. He wants you to grow in knowledge so that you can find his answers. So number one, Christians must continue to grow in faith. Number two, Christians must continue to grow in knowledge. Number three, Christians must seek to grow in the fruit of the seed. So there's the seed concept again. Just like when uh, a physical seed is planted in the ground, out pops a tree and out pops the fruit, right? When the seed of God, which is the word, is planted in our hearts, that seed sprouts up to produce uh, fruits or actions in our life. So, uh, you know, because of the conviction that has been instilled in our hearts by the mind of God, by the Word of God, things start to change, right? We learn this, and then our actions, our thoughts, our way of life is going to dramatically alter the way that it once was. That's called fruits, according to the Scripture. Now, think about it logically. When we understand the commands that God's given us in Scripture, and we see that God, that Jesus said things like, blessed are the peacemakers, where they shall, see the, they shall be called sons of God. When we learn that principle, we then go out and try to practice that principle in our lives. That's fruits of the word. And when Jesus says, love your enemies, uh, then as followers of Christ, we go out and we try to implement that principle into our lives. We try to love our enemies. So the Bible teaches that those actions, those changes of mind, uh, are fruits produced by the word. Or the fruit of the Spirit. So you know, we, we go out and we produce fruit based on what God is telling us to do. Uh, let's go ahead and skip down. John 15, 2. Listen to what he says about producing fruit. He says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. If we're not bearing fruit, he says, he takes us, takes us away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Right? Some, some of the, the, uh, some of the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Discipline that God gives to his children is because he wants you to go out and bear more more fruit for him So we we need to remember that there are spiritual repercussions if we're not producing fruit So what are some of the fruits of course Galatians 5 22 and 23 Paul lists some of the fruits that are produced by the word through the spirit says but the fruit of the spirit is Here's some of the things that are produced love joy peace long-suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Right? All of these godly characteristics will produce, will be produced uh, in the life of a Christian who feeds on the word of God every day. You'll learn these things and you'll start implementing them into your lives. So when we produce fruit, that means we are becoming more like God, more like the one who gave the seed. So as Christians, we need to grow in fruit, and the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, number four, this one's closely tied to number three, but we must grow in works that proclaim our faith. James chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 26, urges us that we need to have a life full of good deeds and actions that demonstrate our faith is absolutely genuine. You know, we must grow in obedience to the Lord as a result of our confidence in Him. So, you know, be because if, if we are genuinely confident in His way that it is right, why would we not go out and then do the things which God would have us to do? James chapter 2, verse 17 says, Thus also faith by itself, 
if it does not have works or actions to go along with it, it's dead. So according to that passage, if we go about claiming to have great faith in the Lord, but we live a life devoid of actions, the Bible says we are spiritually dead if there's no fruit to show for it. So the only logical result of having faith that is a saving faith is obedience that follows. You cannot separate the two, faith and obedience. You know, that's the pattern we see in Scripture. When Noah believed God and he trusted him, he went out and obeyed. He built the ark. When Abraham believed God and he heard his instructions, he went out and did what God told him to do. Now, James chapter 2, verse 21 says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works, his actions, when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? You see how they work hand in hand. Verse 23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And so works are a big part of the Christian life, unlike what many people teach nowadays. Uh, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We need to be producing for his workmanship, uh, Ephesians 2. In Matthew 28, in verse 20, Jesus said to his followers, Observe all things that I have commanded you. Right? Remember to, to keep these things into practice. So these are some of the things we're going to be growing in all of his commandments. Not just some of them. So helping the needy, uh, caring for the poor, visiting the sick, tending the widow and the orphans, teaching the lost, uh, fellowshipping the brethren, edifying the church, uh, worshiping God. Right? The list is long of all the works that we can give our attention to in service to God. So, uh, number five, grow in gratitude. Uh, God has blessed us so much every day as Christians. Therefore, our lives ought to be an outpouring of thanksgiving the deeper and deeper we get into this. As the years go by, and you understand more and more about God's divine revelation and his plan in Scripture, and when you realize how much you really don't deserve it, by the way, you should grow in your thankfulness and your gratitude every single day when you realize where you were. Um, Ephesians 5, verse 20 says, Giving thanks always for all things to, the, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And number six, I said we'll close with this one. Grow in your confidence in, in going home to heaven. Right? As we get closer to death, we ought to have the attitude and the confidence that Paul had. 2 Timothy chapter 4 Verses 6 through 8. What did he say in that great message right before he was ready to be offered? He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who love his appearance. Well, Paul did not doubt his salvation. He wasn't questioning where he would be after this life is over. He knew. And so many times when we first become Christians, sometimes we'll, we'll waver in our faith. Where am I going? I can't be certain of the condition of my soul. Paul was certain. He knew where he was going. The Bible says we can know when we read these words, whether we're lining up to them or not. But God's given us that confidence. So in this lesson, we discuss two major points. Number one, the word of God is how we grow. Don't expect to grow in any of these areas we've talked about if you won't open up that book on a continual basis. That's the source of how we grow, how we get better. It's a mm -hmm. learned process. And number two, we talked about those six areas in which we must continue to grow every day as a Christian. Grow in faith, grow in knowledge, grow in the fruit produced by the Spirit, uh, grow in works, grow in gratitude, and grow in your confidence going home to heaven. So that's our lesson for this morning and our encouragement. Anybody needs to respond to heaven's invitation. It's very simple. Uh, if you're not a Christian, you need to hear that word. Believe it with all your heart that Jesus is the only way to the Father. You have to repent, turn away from those sins, have a change of mind, confess his name before men, and then lastly go down into that water, immersed to wash away those sins, come up a new creature, ready to serve him faithfully until death. So if anybody needs to come for any reason, please do so while we stand and sing. Days are filled with sorrow and care.